brought to you by Charity Mobile, the phone company that sends 5% of your monthly plan price to your favorite charity. No contracts, nationwide coverage, risk-free guarantee. Learn more at CharityMobile.com. The events in the Universal Church this past week, I think, make appropriate a return to St. Vincent of Larens, whom Francis has, in a very ironic way, been quoting to justify his own attacks on sacred tradition. St. Vincent of Larens actually advocates for literally the opposite of the things that Francis advocates for. And in this next excerpt from his book, The Combinatory, which is an ancient text, St. Vincent of Larens provides us a great warning about how even the most seemingly pious can fall into heresy and become enemies of the church. This is a cautionary story for us in our times, because many of the better bishops whose letters I provide to you have on the record rejected thing, teachings of the church from before the council. Again, a cautionary tale for all of us. And it's interesting here because the example he uses is of the teacher Origen, whom some people have erroneously called a doctor of the church. He is not a doctor of the church. He was excommunicated and died a heretic. Many of his writings have been preserved because, as St. Vincent of Larens will tell you here in a moment, much of what he said was true and laudable teaching. He was considered the greatest teacher at the time, and he fell into heresy. Something for us to consider, especially when you eventually come across stories of some of the better bishops doing things like Cardinal Mueller did when he chastised Cardinal Burke and the authors of the Dubia for submitting the Dubia on Amoris Laetitia and claimed that the Amoris Laetitia was rooted in scripture. That should give you pause about Cardinal Mueller. <laughs> and he's just one example, one of many. In fact, his warnings about St. About St. Vincent of Larin's warnings about origin are as applicable today, including to every single one of the Roman pontiffs from the time of the council onwards, as they are about Origen himself. So here is St. Vincent of Larens on Origen as a trial for the church. The error of Origen as a great trial for the church by St. Vincent of Larens. We said above that in the church of God, the teacher's error is the people's trial, a trial by so much the greater in proportion to the greater learning of the erring teacher. This we showed first by the authority of Scripture, and then by instances from church history, of persons who, having at one time had the reputation of being sound in the faith, eventually either fell away to some sect already in existence, or else founded a heresy of their own. An important fact truly, useful to be learnt, and necessary to be remembered, and to be illustrated and enforced again and again, by example upon example, in order that all true Catholics may understand that it behooves them with the Church to receive teachers, not with teachers to desert the faith of the Church. My belief is that among many instances of this sort of trial which might be produced, there is not one to be compared with that of Origen, in whom there were many things so excellent, so unique, so admirable, that antecedently any one who would readily deem that implicit faith was to be placed all his assertions. For if the conversation and manner of life carry authority, great was his industry, great his modesty, his patience, his endurance. If his descent or his eradication, what more noble than if his birth of a house rendered illustrious by martyrdom? Afterwards, when in the cause of Christ he had been deprived not only of his father, but also of all his property, he attained so high a standard in the midst of the straits of holy poverty that he suffered several times, it is said, as a confessor. Nor were these the only circumstances connected with him, all of which afterwards proved an occasion of trial. He had a genius so powerful, so profound, so acute, so elegant, that there was hardly anyone whom he did not very far surpass. The splendors of his learning, and of his erudition generally, were such that there were very few points of divine philosophy, hardly any of human which he did not thoroughly master. When Greek had yielded to his industry, he made himself a proficient in Hebrew. What shall I say of his eloquence, the style of which was so charming, so soft, so sweet, that honey rather than words seemed to flow from his mouth? What subjects were there, however difficult, which he did not render clear and perspicuous by the force of his reasoning? What undertakings, however hard to accomplish, which he did not make to appear more easy? 
but perhaps his assertions rested simply on ingeniously woven argumentation. On the contrary, no. Teacher ever used more proofs drawn from scripture. Then I suppose he wrote little? No man more, so that if I mistake not, his writings not only cannot all be read through, they cannot all be found, for that nothing might be wanting to his opportunities of obtaining knowledge. He had the additional advantage of a life greatly prolonged. But perhaps he was not particularly happy in his disciples. Whoever more so. From his school came forth doctors, priests, confessors, martyrs without number. Then who can express how much he was admired by all, how great his renown, how wide his influence? Who was there whose religion was at all above the com common standard that did not hasten to him from the ends of the earth? What Christian did not reverence him almost as a prophet? What philosopher as a master? How great was a veneration with him, which was regarded not only by his private persons, but also by the court, is declared by the histories which relate how he was sent forth by the mother of the emperor Alexander, moved by the heavenly wisdom with a love of which she, as he, was inflamed. To this also his letters bear witness, which with the authority which he assumed as a Christian teacher, he wrote to the emperor Philip, the first Roman prince that was a Christian. As to his incredible learning, if any one is unwilling to receive the testimony of Christians at our hands, let him at least accept that of the heathens as the ha at the hands of philosophers. For that impious periphery says that when he was little more than a boy, incited by his fame, he went to Alexandria, and there saw him, then an old man, but a man evidently of so great attainments, they had reached the summit of universal knowledge. Time would fail me to recount, even in a very small measure, the excellencies of this man all of which nevertheless not only contributed to the glory of religion, but also increased the magnitude of the trial. For who in the world would lightly desert a man of so great genius, so great learning, so great influence, and would not rather adopt that saying? That he would rather be wrong with origin than be right with others. What shall I say more? The result was that very men, many were led astray from the integrity of faith, not by any human excellencies of this so great man, this so great doctor, this so great prophet, but as the event showed, by the too perilous trial which he proved to be. Hence it came to pass that this origin, such and so great as he was, wantonly abusing the grace of God, rashly followed the bent of his own genius, and placing overmuch confidence in himself, making light account of the ancient simplicity of the Christian religion, presuming that he knew more than all the world besides, despising the traditions of the church and the determinations of the ancients, and interpreting certain passages of scripture in a novel way deserve for himself the warning given to the church of God, as applicable in his case as in that of others. If there arise a prophet in the midst of the, thou shalt not hearken to the words of that prophet, because the Lord your God doth make trial of you whether you love him or not. Truly thus of a sudden to seduce the church which was devoted to him and hung upon him through admiration of his genius, his learning, his eloquence, his manner of life and influence, while she had no fear, no suspicion of herself. Thus I say to seduce the church slowly and little by little from the old religion to a new profaneness was not only a trial, but a great trial. But someone will say, Origen's books have been corrupted. I do, not, I do not deny it. Nay, I grant it readily. For that such is the case has been handed down both orally and in writing, not only by Catholics, but by heretics as well. The po but the point is that though himself be not, yet books published under his name are a great trial, by which abounding in many hurtful blasphemies are both read and delighted in, not as being someone else's, but as being believed to be his, so that although there was no error in Origen's original meaning, yet Origen's authority appears to be an effectual cause in leading people to embrace error. Do you see a cautionary note here for our time about how the example of Origen can definitely be instructive for many of us dealing with the better bishops today. How, when you dig into their writings, because you've become almost like a fan of some of these bishops, you encounter troubling things they've said, things that don't make sense. Curious what you thought of this, so let me know in the comments, please. Like and subscribe if you haven't, it does help, as does sharing this on social media. That helps a lot, too. As always, pray for the church. I'm Anthony Stein. Ave Maria.